Uh, we're gearing up. Feel free to set your chat box to everyone and say hello. If you'd like to say who you are and where you're from, say hello, kind of the equivalent of grabbing a coffee and a pastry and getting to chat in an in-person conference. We're gonna go ahead and get started. Is the volume okay? Can somebody give me a thumbs up? Is my volume okay? Perfect. A little bit more. All right. My name is Carrie and I'm with the Brain Injury Alliance of Arizona. Today with me uh, assisting is Kristen, our operations manager. She'll also be fielding questions in the chat box or you can message her uh, for a private question, <clears throat> anonymous question. We'll also be live on Facebook. So if you prefer to watch on Facebook or your Zoom link drops off, feel free to join us there as well. We are here with Dr. Patricio Reyes. This is our monthly COVID-19 in the brain update. We're so excited to bring you this. Today's talk is on the vaccine and the nervous system, past, present, and future. Just a quick reminder that even during these times where we are trying to social distance, the Brain Injury Alliance of Arizona is open and wet, ready to serve you. Kristen live answers our phone uh, Monday through Friday, nine to five. And we have a staff of certified brain injury specialists ready to work professionals, survivors, and caregivers. We also have a variety of resources. As you're learning more about brain injury or serving those with brain injury, please remember to call on the Brain Injury Alliance offer resources, types of brain injury, how brain injury impacts someone, and also um, some of those things that are get into like where PTSD and TBI overlap or some of those special populations that we want to help you serve. This is for veterans, but we have lots of resources available to you as professionals as well. Um, before COVID, you could have come into our office and browsed, um, but we are have brochures, we have folders for your clients. We have referral process. So please stay connected with us. We also have great posters and flyers around abuse, overdose, and how that can impact the brain and function afterwards. So this is a great piece our state opioid response did on overdose and brain injury. I just really want to take a moment to thank also uh, Dr. Reyes and I were just chatting about this. This is one of his passions as well. I want to thank the congressional members from Arizona who are part of the Brain Injury Task Force. So only members of Congress can join that. And every member of the Arizona delegation, uh, with the exception of Congresswoman Lesko, is part of that. So we are very excited and thankful for our brain health leaders here in Arizona. Also, I have to say a special shout out to our staff. We have two staff members who just passed their certified brain injury specialist. Janice was recertified as a CBIS and Will Grove also obtained his. So congratulations to them. Will Grove is a resource facilitation specialist and Janice is our interpersonal violence liaison and she is busier than ever during these trying times of COVID. Also, Janice is on the cover of Brain Health Magazine. That'll be sent out in an e-blast tomorrow. So without further ado, I wanna invite you to this fantastic program today. We are, uh, you can get more information always on how COVID impacts the brain on our COVID landing page. We are open and ready. And so without further ado, we're gonna have Dr. Reyes join us. He's a founding member of our Brain Health Advisory Council. Prior to to Arizona. He was professor of neurology, Bernard Elfers professor and director of neuropathology, Alzheimer's Dementia Center, and the Brain Bank at the Jefferson College in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Now he's at the Phoenix VA, and we are so pleased to work with him and have him here today. So Dr. Reyes. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Kerry. And ladies and gentlemen, welcome and good evening. And thank you for joining us for this presentation tonight. Uh, first and foremost, I would also like to thank 
the brain, uh, Arizona Brain Injury Alliance of Arizona for sponsoring this event. And as you know, it is a nonprofit organization that truly offers hope and inspiration to all victims of brain injury, which could be due to drugs, toxins, metabolic disorders such as, uh, such as uh, diabetes, neurodegenerative disorders such as Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease, strokes, concussion and other for, uh, forms of head trauma, brain tumors and infections like COVID-19. What I will do this evening is give you a very quick uh, overview of COVID-19, particularly its clinical aspects and what to do uh, if one is suspected of having COVID-19, and then go on to the development of vaccines that are avail available to us at the present time. And then we will move on to what to expect in the future and uh, deal briefly on the uh, uh, neurological complications that may arise from vaccine injection. All right, Dr. Reyes, so, uh, just a reminder to share your screen so we can see the slides. All right. So COVID-19, as we all know, um, started in Wuhan, China in uh, late December of last year and rapidly became a pandemic. And the cause of this uh, pandemic is a SARS-CoV-2, which was presumably uh, uh, isolated from bats. And there's actually another animal that may have it, it's uh, called pangolin, I think. And so right now, uh, we have more than a million of people who um, uh, develop fatal uh, illness from this disease. What are the common symptoms of COVID-19? Uh, shortage of breath is quite common, cough, low-grade fever, chills, and fatigue. The less common symptoms uh, uh, include sore throat, headache, muscle aches and pains, and loss of taste and smell, uh, diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, discoloration of toes, pink eye, and rash. When symptoms uh, worsen, we should call 911, and particularly if we have increased trouble breathing, uh, development of uh, bluish discoloration of our lips or face, which indicates lack of oxygen or hypoxia, persistent chest pain and pressure, confusion, and excessive drowsiness. Now, if one looks at the symptoms of COVID-19 and flu, they're very similar. However, if you compare the morbidity and mortality of both diseases, as you can see here, they're quite different. There's no question that COVID-19 is a much more serious infection with increased morbidity and mortality. <clears throat> so who are at risk for COVID-19. If one has contact with someone carrying SARS-CoV-2, the virus, however, let me just uh, caution you that there's evidence that up to 40 to 60% of infected patients uh, or uh, uh, cases may not have symptoms. So they can spread a disease without symptoms. If one is living with infected patient, the risk goes higher, providing care to infected uh, uh, persons. If one has intimate partner with the virus and older adults with comorbidities such as cancer, heart disease, kidney, pulmonary disease, uh, sickle cell, organ transplant, and uh, type two diabetes, and patients with BMI of more than 30. How about COVID-19 and pregnancy? 
There's evidence now that there's higher risk for complications in pregnancy. Pregnant women who are infected are more like to, likely to experience severe uh, symptoms. There's also higher uh, chance for uh, pregnant women to be admitted to ICU and mortality rate is higher. They also have a, a higher chance of delivering preterm babies. Although intrauterine, intrauterine transmission has not been proven, but the newborn can contract the disease. Now, how do we diagnose COVID-19? We, we need tissue samples, blood, saliva, tissue, and nasal secretion. If one thinks he or she has COVID-19, please stay home, monitor your symptoms. You can schedule a telehealth visit with your primary care doctor or see a doctor in person for examination or go to urgent care or hospital for increased symptoms. Possible complications of COVID-19 uh, is frequently known as pneumonia, novel corona infected, coronavirus infected pneumonia. But 26% of patients may require ICU admission and uh, older individuals may have uh, 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 increased uh, mortality and morbidities. The prominent symptoms are respiratory, they can develop uh, what we call acute respiratory syndrome. Some may uh, have irregular heart rate, uh, shock, kidney failure that may require dialysis, severe muscle pain, fatigue, and heart attack, strokes. And in among children, we have what is known as PMIS, which stands for um, multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children. We also now are seeing patients with uh, neuropsychiatric symptoms and we are concerned about the presence of the symptoms even after the patient has recovered, what we call long-term neuropsychiatric symptoms. Let us go then uh, to the origin of vaccine. The cow is very important, not only for milk or meat, but this is where vaccin vaccination began. In the late 1800, there was a country doctor called Edward Jenner from Berkeley, England, who uh, inoculated a young boy named James Phipps with a uh, uh, ino inoculum from a milkman's a milkmaid's hand um, that was infected by cowpox, and because of this, this young boy did not develop uh, smallpox, and so a lot of uh, uh, mothers and even adults came to see Dr. Jenner for inoculation. And this is a quote from James Phipps that he, is, he was quite happy because we will never have an ugly pockmarked face. And this is how the uh, small packs look like under the microscope. Then this uh, uh, vaccine uh, development uh, was refined by a very well-known uh, scientist, uh, Louis Pasteur, who actually developed the anti-rabies vaccine. And for those who are in the medical field, this is what we look for in patients with rabies. This is where the virus is here in one of the brain cells. And this is called Negri bodies. So let's just define some terms before we go in, uh, deeper into vaccines. We would like to define vaccine, 
vaccination, immunization, and immunity. So vaccines uh, traditionally co contain organisms that may cause disease, such as measles uh, and other uh, bacteria, but they are killed or weakened so that they don't cause sickness or disease. Some vaccines may only contain part of the disease uh, organism that could be virus or a bacteria. The vaccine is designed to stimulate our uh, immune system so that we produce antibodies against the offending uh, organism. You then develop immunity and uh, uh, so that you don't get the disease. This makes vaccines much powerful as a preventive treatment uh, and even in, uh, 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 in some instances can treat and cure the disease. Vaccination on the other hand is the process of protecting people against harmful diseases before they come in contact with the offending agent. So because of the vaccine, we um, develop our natural defenses and uh, we become resistant to specific infections and make, and make our immune system much stronger. So vaccines are developed uh, to create antibodies uh, in, our, in, our, in uh, individuals. So that if one is exposed to the disease uh, after vaccination, the, the person doesn't develop sickness or if they develop sickness is milder for them. They're usually given injection, but some are given orally. Immunization, on the other hand, is the process, process of giving a vaccine to a person to protect them against disease. And again, um, by defining immunity, we protect individuals through the process of immunization so that you, the individuals will not get the disease, but instead uh, getting the disease, uh, but instead of getting the disease before you get the vaccine. So <clears throat> after uh, uh, vaccination or uh, immunization, we, we are expected now to have uh, uh, the antibodies that will recognize what is known as self molecules and distinguish them from non self molecules, uh, which are found in infectious organisms and toxins. By the way, this is also the principle behind the use of antibodies now in cancer, because our bodies consider them as foreign agents, so you can develop, use now antibodies to. Uh, treat cancer. So um, the immune system is a co complex network uh, of cells and proteins distributed around the body. Tonsils, adenoids, lymph nodes, thymus gland, appendix, bone marrow, all this are dis distributed uh, throughout our bodies and they are natural defense mechanisms. So, and they can adapt to situations, like when there is an offending organism, whereas we have what is known as the innate defenses, such as eyes, so some respiratory tract the, uh, that involves the nose, the trachea and the lungs, and the skin. These are innate protective defenses. Now, <clears throat> then let's go to what we have uh, at the present time. Uh, we have uh, three vaccines uh, available to us right now and approved. One is similar to conventional vaccine, and that is the AstraZeneca. 
and when, when we have two messenger RNA vaccines. The antibody treatment is still not available to us uh, for the general public. Now, <clears throat> conventional vaccines, exemplified by AstraZeneca, contains the same organism that causes the disease. These organisms are either killed or weakened to the point that they do not produce sickness. It stimulates our immune system to produce antibodies. But they use a virus vector, harmless vi virus, as a carrier of, 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 <clears throat> of the uh, weakened or dead virus. And after vaccination, uh, uh, you, we develop antibodies. In uh, COVID-19, as you look at here on your left, this is a sort of an artist uh, 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 a portrayal of what we see under the electron microscope when we look at SARS-2, uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus. It's like a crown around it, so it's called corona. And this spike protein is the one that uh, uh, triggers the immune system and is responsible uh, for the disease and the symptoms. So <clears throat> what happens now is that portion of this protein is carried by harmless uh, uh, virus and is injected into uh, the body and resulting in the production of antibodies. And it is believed now that AstraZeneca uh, vaccine uh, uh, pre, uh, is effective in 62%. We don't know how long that protection will last. Uh, we need to know whether we need booster doses of this. And it is supposed to be very affordable because the company uh, is willing to sell it at cost. Now, Johnson & Johnson is being considered seriously as another um, vaccine similar to AstraZeneca. They also use an adenovirus as a vector for the vaccine. Now, what are mRNA vaccines? Well, let's define this and understand what RNA means. RNA stands for ribonucleic acid. And to your left, and all living cells have RNA or nucleic acid. If you have a cell, this is the nucleus of the cell and this is the cytoplasm, the RNA doesn't enter the nucleus where the DNA is, okay? So the DNA <clears throat> uh, simply tells the cell to produce antibodies or proteins. It doesn't affect or influence the DNA. And this is how it looks in a, in a cartoon. Uh, uh, <clears throat> the DNA is double stranded, whereas RNA is single stranded. And this uh, proteins here are very important because they have to follow a certain pattern. If they are substituted, deleted, uh, then you could have what is known as mutation or replaced by some. So the sequence and the, uh, the type of protein here uh, has to be or have to be maintained. And this is how it looks. The, uh, the vaccine is injected into frequently on the arm it enters the cell, it tells the immune cell to produce antibodies and you have an immune response. Some cells are called memory cells and they remember that in case there is a reinfection, those cells will be able to provide immunity as well. And this is just a diagram of how the uh, vaccine or MR, mRNA rather vaccine work. You don't have 
uh, a, um, a vector, a virus vector, you're merely uh, injecting a synthesized um, portion of the protein that causes immune reaction. The story of mRNA is, has been rocky for uh, decades because although uh, we have uh, the newest vaccines as mRNA, this uh, uh, concept has been uh, uh, in the research bench for a few decades. And some of those early workers actually uh, were ostracized because of uh, proposing those ideas. So there were many roadblocks. Their careers were threatened and some of them even lost their job. Uh, private funding was discontinued in some instances. So if we compare the Pfizer vaccine and Moderna, incidentally, BioN Tech is a German company that collaborated with Pfizer. So both mRNA, both requires two doses, about the same protection rate. Pfizer needs a special freezer up to minus 70 degrees Fahrenheit. The regular uh, refrigerator uh, a freezer can be used for Moderna. And the Pfizer vaccine has to be used sh shortly after it's open, whereas Moderna stability is longer, you can use it up to several days. Now, <clears throat> this type of uh, uh, vaccine, I mean messenger RNA, does not use a weakened or inactivated uh, uh, organism to our bodies. The mRNA simply teaches the cell how to produce proteins and that protein triggers the immune response that we have discussed previously. Uh, <clears throat> so it's like the, sh the chef teaching his assistant to deliver the recipe to the cook who will then produce the right uh, food based on the recipe that the, uh, the chef uh, designed. And that's what uh, uh, sort of analogy with messenger RNA. <clears throat> and so uh, the, the advantages of messenger RNA is that it can be produced synthetically, very rapidly, and can be available to a, a large number of population around the world. We still have to remember that these vaccines will have to be um, determined in terms of distribution, uh, depending on age, how many doses, do we need booster uh, doses, where to go for vaccination. The general medical status of the patients have to be considered. Uh, we, we talk about comorbidities and the physiological factors that may be present in those recipients. What are the potential side effects? There's an allergy or hypersensitivity. We don't know how long the protection will be. There is no evidence, although there's some questions raised about, there's no evidence that it affects DNA. And what are the long-term effects of these vaccines? And that's why we are monitoring and we have to monitor carefully uh, the effects of this vaccine short-term wise and long-term. How about mutation? If those uh, proteins I mentioned to you are changed in terms of uh, arrangement, substituted, omitted, or replaced, then you can have mutation. So, and it can be a permanent mutation. So that then look at this, you can see here, for instance, this grapefruit, one is uh, orange and one is red. 
So one could assume that there is some mutation and look at this flower tube, the different colors. And the beauty of this is that you can sell this at a much higher price because that is mutated plant. So uh, <clears throat> it is very important that to remember that when an organism uh, affects an individual for some time, it is possible that this organisms can mutate and change. And what does it mean? Well, uh, it may not be responsive to the original vaccine, although there's evidence that our current vaccines protect us from these mutations that we are, face we are facing right now. And, and it could be deleterious. On the other hand, the, the virus or the bacteria could mutate and become less infective and may cause less serious disease. For instance, the, uh, the uh, swine flu vaccine disappeared. The Middle East SARS vaccine, uh, uh, um, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, the, uh, the swine flu uh, disappeared after two years. Same thing with the Middle East uh, 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 SARS virus disappeared after two years. So uh, it could be uh, beneficial as, uh, as well if there is mutation. And this is just to show you what happens when there is a mutation. And you can see that this is the normal sequence of those uh, bases we described. And when this is changed like this one, then you have a mutation, see? It should be T, here it's C. That is enough to cause mutation. So this could be substitution, deletion, or insertion. Now, <clears throat> we now ha are facing uh, mutations. We expect this to occur as long as we have uh, 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 COVID-19 all over the world. And now we have well-described mutations in England and, and, and South Africa. And again, uh, this is the distribution of mutations around the world. You can see that in, uh, in, in, in England in particular, you have, and in South um, Africa, and we are also have now, we also have now mutations uh, uh, described in the United States. Now, how about vaccine in the nervous system? Just uh, uh, remember that this is one brain cell or neuron. This is the cell body. This is what we call the axon. It's one of the uh, tentacles that allows communication with different uh, cell bodies or brain cells. In order for this to send impulses very rapidly in terms of milliseconds. That's why when we think we're able to speak right away because of this myelin sheet, this bluish thing. The axon is covered by myelin sheet, which is actually cholesterol. And instead of the stimulus or the signal, traveling to the action very slowly, it jumps because of this uh, 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 <clears throat> myelin sheath. So it jumps and the transmission of signals is very rapid. In the myelination, which could be a potential complication of vaccines is demyelination, meaning destruction of myelin sheath. And look at this. So the denuded uh, portions of the axons do not have this. That's why patients with demyelinating disease such as MS and Guillain-Barre uh, are very slow because the transmission is much delayed. And so what happens? There's weakness. Breathing may actually be compromised and they may stop breathing. There's a loss of sensation, balance, 
The vision, particularly in MS, is quite common, eye pain and double vision. There may be difficulty with the speech and swallowing, and also changes in blood pressure and heart rate, known as autonomic symptoms. So <clears throat> just to show you how it looks like in multiple sclerosis here, you have a brain with all these white spots due to areas of demyelination. Patients who have a spinal cord lesion called transverse myelitis, you can see this arrow here, and here you have the white spots, and so patients may get paralyzed. Then there's another entity called central pontine myelinolysis, where you have the stem of the brain having areas of demyelination, and so patients frequently have problems moving and uh, swallowing and speaking. The last involves peripheral nerves, and this is Guillain-Barre, okay? I had the opportunity to treat a patient of mine with Guillain-Barre a few months ago. And this is what happens uh, when the nerve sheath or the myelin sheath is destroyed and these this axons are denuded. And so patients may get uh, a sensation of tingling and numbness, and they get weak, usually from the feet up. And that's why we're very concerned whenever patient has Guillain-Barre, our biggest fear is that they may stop breathing anytime. All right? Having said this, there are also myths about COVID-19 vaccine. Questions include, can COVID vaccine make me sick with COVID-19? No. Will I test positive for COVID-19 on viral test after receiving the vaccine? No. It doesn't contain the virus. If I have already had COVID-19 and recovered, do I still need to get vaccinated? Yes, because we don't know how long the protection will be. And it is only effective up to 95%. So there's still a 5% chance of getting infected. Will the COVID-19 vaccination protect me from getting sick with COVID-19? Yes. Will COVID-19 vaccinate alter my DNA? No, it won't. Doesn't have any contacts I showed you with DNA. Is it safe for me to get a COVID-19 vaccine if I would like to have a baby one day? The evidence suggests that there's no effect on pregnancy. However, if the preg a pregnant woman becomes uh, infected, then there are potential consequences of infection during pregnancy. <clears throat> the, the horizon is quite bright for the use of vaccines and human infirmity. We have now uh, uh, antibodies for MS and lupus. We have antibodies for cancer, allergies, infections. There is now uh, one antibody that's being uh, proposed as a treatment for Alzheimer's disease, strokes, and head trauma. We have major challenges um, in vaccine development. We need to make sure that they are safe uh, after injection, few days or weeks after injection or after introduction of the vaccine or chronic. How effective is it? How long is the uh, protection? Can we produce it in large scale so that everybody or most of the world can have access to that vaccine? How can we produce it rapidly? That's one of the advantages of messenger RNA vaccine because you can re readily produce it and meet the demand of different populations around the world. How do we store it? How bad 
Uh, what are the requirements for storage? Uh, route of administration, the cost, of course, is very important because we have some brothers and sisters who live in uh, less developed countries and the distribution. So I thought the pathway to future vaccines will continue. We will have to be innovative. We'll have to develop effective vaccines that are tolerable and safe, both uh, governmental and the public uh, and the private uh, entities, I hope will continue to invest in this uh, 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 endeavor and public health policies should be based on science and not on politics. So the new vaccines that we can look forward to will uh, use live but attenuated, either weakened or dead viruses, nucleic acid-based vaccines, more mRNA, there are many more that are in the pipeline, non-replicating vectors, recombinant uh, nanoparticles and peptide vaccines. One of the reasons we have progressed quite a bit and rapidly is because of the human genome project. It is. It was an international project. The funding mostly came from the United States. Thank you very much, and be safe, everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Reyes. Do we have, that was fascinating. Uh, thank you for that new and emerging information. Kristen, do we have any questions? I know that um, I've gotten emailed a couple for you and one is, should people with brain injury, uh, do you have any advice for them on considering the vaccine? Did, did you yeah. did you raise a question, Carrie? Yeah, uh, yes. yeah we, we had an email question. Should those with TBI, so if someone has had a TBI, should they consider the vaccine? Uh, yes, there's really no evidence that victims of TBI should not uh, be uh, given vaccine. I think uh, the immune system is usually not... Uh, seriously damage in patients with TBI. Of course, if the patient is severely injured or comatose, we may have to um, uh, reconsider that. But 75% of traumatic brain injury is concussion. And many of those patients, most of those patients are eligible for vaccination. All right, I do have a question here from, um, um, looks like Mag, or Maggie. So I'll ask you to unmute yourself if you'd like to ask it uh, directly. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for the presentation. That was very informative. I just- Can you speak louder, question. please? Can you speak louder, please? Certainly. Thank you so much for the presentation. It was very informative. My question goes as for when you were talking about the myelin, when it gets affected like in Guillain-Barre, but does the vaccine or the virus affect this myelin in some way? So will it be a concern for uh, having the vaccine or is it only when you get the infection or how is the, the correlation with this myelin? Thank you. I actually uh, had that question come in as well. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> there is no evidence that the virus itself could cause uh, the myelination. Now, let me just um, uh, tell you that when this uh, uh, question 